We'll now come to working group three, which deals with methods and tools. We do a slightly different scheme here. Um, Eleni, Hatzi, and myself, we are making a presentation that, from our point of view, should cover most of the aspects. And we also will have to, in addition to that, a discussion where you can tell us what all we forgot. The idea is that we get some kind of overview on methods and tools that are out there and that are relevant to value of information of structural health monitoring. Um, continue. So the, the one and a half hours is split into these following sections. So the first thing will be this uh, overview presentation, approximately 50 minutes, uh, in which we have made two parts. The first part is dealing with methods and tools for translating data into information. And that is not the actual core of this um, cost action, but we found that many of the contributions and people, experts in the room here, are actually working in that direction. The second part is then really on the quantification and the optimization of the value of information, which I think most of the presentations in the morning were speaking about that. Um, so this will be the talk, and then we will have these goals, and this is really the, the discussion that we want to have with everybody here, not just people who are in working group three uh, tomorrow. So what, will, what should be the goals of this, this uh, cost action, in particular working group three? What should we do, and how should we do it? So this should be some kind of general discussion. The organization, I think, will be also delayed for tomorrow mostly, but if you have some input on the organization, we might look at that as well. And then finally, we have a poster session, so we have contributions from different people. Um, so we decided to make these as, as posters. We will go outside all together, and people will briefly present their poster, and afterwards you can discuss with the people over a coffee about their work. I will also inter introduce some of these posters during the talk. Let's just start, and I just put this picture, not because you should now read all the details, but to show that obviously there are a lot of frameworks, and also in the morning we have seen multiple examples of how to consider, how to look at SHM and the whole value chain that is involved, from the actual measurement to the decision in the end about what to do with my system. And uh, the nice colorful one above here is from Eleni, um, and it also shows, highlights that you have different type of physical models involved, and we'll speak about that. You use, you might also have non-physical models, and this is also something that we have to consider. Uh, sometimes you might not have models at all, which is actually also something that is kind of difficult to handle in the framework of preposterior analysis. Um, then we have to interpret that data and to come up ultimately with decisions that the decisions themselves might involve making new inspections, making new monitoring systems. So it's also a continuous chain that never really ends, which makes it difficult sometimes to quantify these things. Um, these are two examples from posters that, are, that you find outside. So one is by uh, Timo, difficult last name, Schwegendieck. Uh, but Timo has a nice example of an application, and another one is on aircraft SHM by Giulio Cotone. Uh, and there are many different frameworks, and all of these are obviously targeted towards specific applications. And the problem is that depending on the application, we will need different tools and methods to model and to calculate what we need. And therefore, in this presentation, we will present quite a large variety of different methods and tools that are out there, um, pro probably by no means complete, which are allowing us, in a specific case, um, to do the optimization and hopefully the quantification of the value of information. Okay, no, enough for that. So I'll start with the first part, and that is we have systems that measure something, 
And this is pure data in my understanding. But then we want to translate that into information. And we have a variety of methods and tools that help us here. First of all, of course, we have the, the tools that actually give us the data. Now, this is not really, I think, a focus so much of this cost action. But of course, we have to consider that depending on which tool we use, we get different sorts and type of data. Time series, just different points, high dimensional data, big data. And that will, again, change what we have to do. There's one, one poster outside from people in Genova that present you know, testing methods that they have in their lab. And you see the variety of things that you can do. Then, and this is a, I think a nice uh, poster that is outside, and you will see later from Carmen Andrade and her group. We have to, and this is also some, already something where we think about the value of the information, hmm? or even though it's mostly done qualitatively. It's the question, okay, I can measure different things, but typically I cannot measure directly what I need, what I want to know. I typically cannot measure directly the, the defect. I can only get often indirect information. But some of that might be very useful. And so this concept of indicators, the question is what are appropriate indicators and the techniques to monitor them for a specific problem. It's really at first, at first a qualitative problem and then hopefully in this part of this cost action, we also get maybe some quantitative indication as to which of these indicators is more useful than others and compa combi comparing that with the cost of obtaining these indicators, um, we can again assess the, uh, what we should do. Yeah. But of course, the, tip the typical, we will combine different indicators and this is also something that has to be uh, made possible by our tech tools. How do we combine different indicators and how do we quantify that? Then another poster actually, that is now the next step. We measure something, but even if we measure, let's say, if we measure directly or indirectly, we never measure exactly what we want to know. There's always measurement uncertainty, noise, and if it's indirect, obviously we have uncertainty associated with the quantity that we want to predict. And so uh, this poster by O'Byron and several contributors that are here today, they look at the, well, as part of their work, they look at the quantification of the quality. And, and what we typically use are these tools such as probability of detection. How good are we in detecting some defect, for example, a discrete event. But also, not to be forgotten and very important is the probability of getting it wrong the other, in the other direction. What is the probability of predicting something when there is nothing there? And this can apply directly to the monitoring device, but it can also apply to the whole system, which is not just the device itself, but it's the interpretation of the, the data and so on. And then, if you don't know what is this curve, this is so-called receiver operating curve, which is the combination of probability of detection and probability of false alarms. And it's, even though I haven't heard it this, this morning, I think it's a very important concept that we should not forget about in this context of this cost action. So there are methods, such as the one presented here, that allow us to obtain these PODs, PFAs, ROC curves. So then we have quantified the quality of the data with respect to what we want to predict. Then we have, and this is now a core part, we typically assume in, in in, in most of these applications, and in, if you look at patient decision analysis and preposterior analysis, we assume that we have a model. It can be a very simple model, just empirical or Markov chain or something simple, or it can be a very complicated finite element based uh, model with many parameters. But we assume that we have a model, and we have inputs that are stochastic. The model itself might be stochastic as well, and then we have an output. And if the input is stochastic, the output will also be random. Uh, subject to uncertainty, epistemic as well as aleatory. Now, what we do in the monitoring is we might measure input, and if we do that, we can then learn about the input. That is kind of trivial, I say, even though it might not be always trivial, but this is statistics. We can use Bayesian statistics. We can use other type of statistics, but this is nothing special, I think. 
In most cases, however, we measure some kind of response of the system. And then what we have to do is an inverse analysis where we start at the response and go back to the input. And this is what we call the, and, and this can be done using a Bayesian approach. And this is what we mostly use, but not exclusively. Um, it's also practical here to use Bayesian because, of course, this ties well into the Bayesian decision analysis framework. But there are, of course, alternatives. And they, sometimes when people use Bayesian, they always think that, and I, be, I belong to some extent to those people as well, we believe that you know, if you do things in a Bayesian way, everything is perfect. Bayesian is the right thing. And it's almost like a philosophy, like a uh, religion. So, yeah. But you have to be aware that, of course, while the theory might be perfect, the, the models that we have, and even the models of the uncertainties that we use in this framework are not perfect. And that leads sometimes to quite uh, completely wrong results. And actually, in the, this morning in the bus, I was dis discussing with Costas Papamilitrio about some of these cases. And uh, so you have to be careful. And there are, there are alternative approaches. I just want to mention one, for example, that is a nice approach, which looks at that from a different perspective. So it's not, we cannot do this only in a Bayesian framework, but we can do this in different frameworks. Uh, this inverse analysis I'm thinking about. But if you do it in a Bayesian framework, everybody has seen this picture, uh, or if not, then you should see it. Okay. In the Bayesian context, we start with a prior model, and then this might be highly uncertain, but then we get information, and this likelihood function represents my information. And some of this probability of detection that you've seen before is a likelihood function for example. So this describes my measurement. A measurement error is like a likelihood, can look like a likelihood function. And if you combine the two, prior and posterior, we get uh, the, the prior and likelihood, we go on to the posterior, shown here in green, in this nice figure by one of my students. Um, the combination of, the, so basically it's the multiplication, I say it's a plus, but in reality it's a multiplication of the two and then we get to the green distribution, which is the posterior model, which now is combines my, uh, what I knew before and what I have measured. And typically, it reduces the uncertainty. So this, you see the width here is slightly smaller than the width of both likelihood and prior. So now there are many methods, what I call general purpose type of, you have a numerical model, you have response, and then you have input, and you want to go back from the response to the input. And there are these general purpose type of models Sometimes analytical solutions, Markov J, Monte Carlo, approximation methods, sequential methods, and uh, something that uh, rejection sampling methods. And uh, actually, the poster, oh, I didn't say here. Oh, it says here, okay. Yes. So the poster by Costas Papa Minitrio shows some of these methods. And uh, he's really one of the experts in this. Okay. I'm just going quickly through some of these, but I want to motivate this, the youth of Bayesian. Besides the fact that it ties well into this decision analysis, it has also some other advantages. And this is just a very simple example we did for, uh, uh, to, to test a new, new, new method. And this is basically you assume that we have this beam and we measure deformations with some kind of video device at each point. Okay? So we have many measurements. They are subject to some uncertainty. We assume we know the truth. In this case, it's a hypothetical. And um, we can then back calculate to this inverse analysis, we get a, an estimate of the flexibility, okay. which is one over the modulus of elasticity. Um, and you can see that we get, this is the true value, which is a random, it's, it's a random process or a random field, if you want. It's a true value, which we assume we know. And then if you do a maximum likelihood estimate, so just fit your model, which has 50 parameters, so it's completely overfitted to the data. You see this is the estimate if you do a maximum likelihood. If you use a Bayesian approach, it actually regulates the problem because of the use of this prior. And uh, so it regulates the problem. The Bayesian estimate is this, what you see here, this credible interval, which actually is the 95%. So this is a distribution. It doesn't give me one value. It gives me a distribution, which tells me that within 95% with probability, my true solution is somewhere in this uh, 95% credible interval. Okay, this is an example where we made everything linear, so that's why we use flexibility, and uh, Gaussian, so we get analytical solution. This is for reference purposes, but in reality, of course, that's not the case. So what people use often, and it was mentioned in the morning, is Markov chain Monte Carlo, MCMC, 
And essentially, it does, what it does is produces samples of a Markov chain, correlated samples, that as you wait long enough, those samples will follow the posterior distribution. What long enough means is not always clear in practice, which is one of the problems. Uh, you see, this is actually done by Jesus. Here, he made this one, it's one, one, from one of his examples, where you see here, if you don't have data, we make these samples, and they already follow this posterior distribution, so they all follow the same distribution. If you include now monitoring data, you can do the same, and this chain at the beginning has to find the, post, doesn't, has to find the location of the posterior distribution, so you have this kind of behavior here, and eventually it finds the true distribution and it converges to the solution. So this is a method that is very often used. It comes from statistics, not so much from our field, but it's very often used. But the problem really is this convergence behavior, which is in our problems often very poor. So this is a simple example, but it doesn't work. So, but this is also included in many of more advanced methods that actually are more, more targeted towards what we do. Uh, one of those, are, or, or another class of those, is sequential Monte Carlo methods, which includes PMCMC, which is actually not an MCMC method, even though the name is mis misleading. Uh, the, but this is very popular in our field. And uh, as I said, Costas can explain this better. But the, uh, the idea is that we have uh, here is our posterior distribution. We start to sample from our prior, and gradually we approach this posterior distribution by doing sequential important sampling. And that is one method that is kind of commonly used. Another approach is rejection sampling. You just sample again from the prior. And we assume here that the prior distribution is actually like this. So these black points are from the prior distribution. We additionally sample these auxiliary variables. We then kind of plot the likelihood function here. And all the samples that are within this green area follow the posterior distribution. OK, if you don't believe me true solution against, exact, uh, against the approximate solution. This is a classical principle. But we can also frame this in the context of reliability methods. So we can use, we can transform everything in standard normal space. Some of you know reliability methods. And then we can use structural reliability methods to do this more efficiently. Because the probability, sometimes the probability of landing in this domain is 10 to the minus 100 or 10 to the minus 10. So you have to produce many, many samples before you find some samples that are useful. But if you use, actually, if you use uh, these structural liability methods, you can do it more efficiently. I'll show you a brief example here again. I want to identify the stiffness of these two, uh, this is two-story building, if you want, and we want to identify the two stiffness values, first floor, second floor. And we sample from the prior distribution. This is highly, uh, um, let's say, un or large uncertainty, but kind of, have many different possibility values. And we want to now get by rejection sampling to the posterior solution. So we use a combination of this with subset simulation. And again, it's kind of sequentially, we approach the posterior distribution. If you know structural reliability, you can very well easily implement this. And this works nicely also in high dimensions. So if you have hundreds of parameters, this works. You see also here, we have these sequential solutions. So they often, many of these most of these methods work sequentially. They start from the prior and sequentially approximate the posterior, which is my updated model. This is now my updated model. And you see it's so-called locally identifiable. We have two possible regions of solution. OK. Just very briefly, another possibility is to use uh, Bayesian networks for doing Bayesian analysis. And we have one poster on this. So I will do it very, very briefly. I just want to mention that in Bayesian networks, what we do is we model the problem as, no, as graphically through nodes that are individually, um, actually, I will just make one sentence because I, really, I look at the time and I hope you're already over time. So just one sentence. The, the Bayesian network works very efficiently graphically because we account for the conditional independence among random variables. And in this way, we can much more efficiently deal with potentially many, many random variables. And we can solve them either analytically or, um, well, analytically not, but exact, if you discretize, or through sampling methods again. And I will just refer to the poster for a bit more information. And then I will hand over to my co-presenter.
So um, thank you for uh, handing uh, over the floor. I, I will now have to take you back to a bit of the more basics of, uh, let's say, the structural health monitoring concept where, um, as in the case of reliability, uncertainty also exists at the core of acquiring our data. And so there is a point into understanding how we can take this into, the, into account during uh, uh, the imposed methodologies, but also how we can translate what is extracted into indices or features that can then be better exploited by um, the methodologies described uh, uh, by Daniel. So um, starting from the uh, tools that we uh, use for uh, the monitoring of such systems, I mentioned here the system identification framework where you all know is divided in essentially into uh, the forward and the inverse problem. Where in the forward problem, typically we would like to simulate a system in order to get some kind of confidence in, uh, with respect to its response. Uh, and uh, in the case of the inverse formulation, we uh, monitor the system, uh, acquiring measurements of uh, different types, uh, and then try to calibrate uh, our models, uh, our initial models, uh, based on the, uh, uh, so that the reality matches the representation. So in system identification, we typically have two ways of acquiring uh, the, the uh, models of the system, and these may be obtained either analytically, uh, meaning as you would do the forward problem formulation and then proceed to experimental fine tuning in the inverse uh, framework. This has more to do with finite element model updating as we call it and there uh, Bayesian methodologies have a ni very nice uh, uh, framework for implementation. Uh, and they can also be directly obtained uh, experimentally uh, through structural identification. Uh, sorry, usually re resulting in the, either into physical based uh, uh, representations or sometimes to just uh, data driven representations. And in the recent years, there is some tendency to also prefer the data driven representation because it doesn't necessitate an existence of a system that we uh, precisely know. Uh, and why is this relevant? Well, because uh, the identification of these systems comes with a number of uncertainties all the, already from the point of, uh, from the time of acquisition. Uh, we have uh, uncertainties that are relating to the loads themselves, which are usually uh, either uh, unknown or simulated with some simplifying assumptions. Uh, we have the system itself, which is uh, uh, usually in simulation considered deterministic, but in reality is nothing but that, since we uh, hardly ever uh, precisely know the behavior of uh, the, the properties of the system, but even the behavior of special components in there, where uh, typically where energy is dissipated. And of course, even uh, through the acquisition of measurements, there is the issue of uh, noise, which is inherently relating uh, with these uh, instruments. And so in, uh, in order to be able to take all of these into account, we need appropriate methodologies that can account for uh, these noise uh, terms. Either these are model-based uh, uh, errors or, uh, let's say, uh, errors from acquisition. And so what you see here is a, is a bit of a segregation that I mentioned earlier, the fact that we can use either a physics-based approach and that could uh, uh, mean some sort of finite element model that uh, we might have uh, of the system or some sort of lower order model that we could potentially fashion from uh, measurements that could be expressed in the time or frequency domain, but which usually comes with uh, some uh, uh, parameters, or we could uh, use a data-driven modeling approach. And that means uh, I'm just using the data um, without really any uh, knowledge of the structure uh, at hand, uh, uh, which however is still uh, in the position to provide me with information that I need for monitoring the condition of the system. Uh, these basic segregations uh, pertain to the linear system case, but the corresponding extensions already exist in the non-linear and non-stationary case, and this is very important, especially when uh, discussing new systems such as, for instance, wind turbine structures where for sure you're in the non-stationary uh, case. Now for solving these systems uh, and in doing so in a, in a first, let's say, processing stage in a rather in a real-time manner, uh, we again could use uh, a Bayesian, uh, let's say, uh, approach. And this would mean we have to operate in a two-stage process where we in a first stage predict, uh, let's say, uh, the response of our system, given that some sort of approximative model exists, uh, or uh, and in a second stage, uh, we can update the model based on the measurements that we receive, uh, commonly real time. So in the framework I'm describing here, the goal usually is to try and be fast and not to do this offline, but as data is attained. 
One way of doing this, uh, or one typical approximation, uh, Bayesian approximation used within such a framework is the well-known Kalman filter, uh, which in the linear case is basically just expressed as what I said before, a prediction step where you use your model to predict the state and an update step where you use the discrepancy of the measurement uh, to uh, add a, waiting, uh, a weighted correction to your prediction and this would be your posterior uh, uh, estimation at this time step k. Or, and uh, when discussing nonlinear systems, which is, let's say, the more challenging and even more realistic case, since hardly any system is linear, you can use some of the available alternatives uh, for treating nonlinear uh, models. Now, the available alternatives are not far from the Bayesian, uh, let's say, framework explained earlier. They work on uh, the concept of using particles that approximate our distributions, and you, as uh, Typically, we don't know this. Uh, usually, we make for our initial step an assumption on uh, the prior distribution, which uh, is um, stepwise updated until you reach to a posterior estimate, which gives you some confidence uh, in the, uh, uh, let's say, state evolution of your system. Um, so let me just explain here a few applications of these types of uh, tools. Um, the very first application and the most commonly, uh, let's say, published uh, or the, the most commonly met in the literature so far is the case of uh, joint uh, state and parameter estimation, either we're discussing linear or nonlinear systems. And what this means is typically we're dealing with systems whose parameters are not known. If you have a vibration-based monitoring system mo mounted on these uh, uh, structures, then this would usually be a system that has limited observations. We can hardly ever uh, claim we can have a very dense grid of sensors. And uh, what we typically would like to have is a prediction of the overall state responsive and in unmeasured locations, but also an estimate of the characteristics of the structure. And this can be done through the use of the methods I ex uh, explained earlier. Here is the numer uh, numerically generated case of a nonlinear hysteretic system. And in the plots, you see the prediction of the state response so of the real system is in blue, and then some approximating methods, some underperform, some perform very well. All of them work in real time, uh, which is quite important. And also the prediction of the parameters of, of the system. In a second implementation, which sort of makes it clearer why we need things that run in real time, you see the application of the above framework for control. In the case where you're trying to use a magneteorological damping device, for instance, to suppress vibration mitigation of a structure, uh, in this case, we studied a laboratory experiment on a scaled shear frame, where we try to mitigate the vibration by using a, uh, an MR damper that is mounted here on the first floor. And we are, where we additionally assume, unlike what typically happens in control, that the, the system we here have in our hands is a system that is not known precisely. So we don't really know the stiffness properties of the system. By using the, uh, the methods I explained earlier, in this case, the incentive Kalman filter, and coupling them with control strategies, one can come up with adaptive control tools that are able to take into account the uncertainty of the system and not only uh, achieve efficient control, but also uh, provide an estimate of the characteristics of the system at hand, which is quite important. Uh, in a, uh, a further implementation, I'm referring here to work that we did jointly with uh, Kostas Papadimitriou on uh, an issue that is quite pertinent uh, to, uh, the, let's say, the latest trends of identification from the point of view that uh, we most commonly operate with under the basis of unknown loading. So what do you do uh, in the case where uh, loading is unknown but cannot really be modeled as ambient uh, or through another simplif simplifying assumption mm -hmm. as is done commonly? In this case, you can adapt the filters I explained earlier to try and um, uh, achieve a joint input state uh, estimation, meaning not only the response of the system, but all, also uh, uh, the acting load. Uh, having said that, what we care about mostly is actually the accurate response of the system, uh, which would then be uh, exploited in order to uh, get some estimates of the strain and therefore of the fatigue prediction accumulation that you might have in your structure. Uh, this is also quite important since the uh, uh, estimate of fatigue is inherently related to condition assessment and uh, in uh, the latest years it has become apparent that we need methodologies for predicting uh, effects like deterioration or fatigue uh, rather than just the promise of uh, uh, extreme event detection or damage that is associated with that. 
Um, coming, however, to the, uh, let's say, uh, detection of damage, or in any case, uh, in the detection of uh, the change of uh, the state in the system, we can also look at the implementation of uh, what I mentioned before as data-driven methods. So methods that actually do not require an underlying uh, simulation uh, model uh, that is uh, in a finite element type or in the time domain. Uh, there is a quite a lot of literature on the topic of detecting damage under varying conditions, and uh, it exists because it's really a hard task to uh, try to uh, and segregate bet between what is really damaged the system and what comes from variation of uh, environmental effects or other uh, kind of operating conditions, such as traffic or uh, wind loads. Uh, a, number, uh, a wide class of models exist in the literature for this. Uh, uh, there's a multi-model approach, feature extraction methods, and functional models. And I will show you here something we use, which is basically a combination of the two latest, later uh, categories I explained before. Uh, this is an approach that is re uh, relying on the use of polynomial chaos expansion in order to take into account statistical information on the input loads which are not precisely known, meaning temperature, traffic, on, or any other type of load that you cannot actually precisely measure, but you, that you can have some idea on its statistics, which are then combined with measurements from the system uh, in order to be able to derive a functional representation between response of the system, which could be either in the uh, form of uh, natural frequencies or model shapes, and these influencing factors. Once you know this functional representation, then you can actually take it out of your uh, response and you can fashion indices, and that's where I said it's important to know how to, it's important to come up with quantities that can be related to condition assessment, so you can fashion indices that uh, can tell us whether the response is between regular operating conditions or not. Um, I think, yeah, I don't want to take up too much time, so I'll just briefly explain how this polynomial chaos tool works. Uh, under the assumption that you have some sort of input parameter that follows a given statistic, uh, and uh, given that you also have some sort of unknown, in this case we have generated it, but let's say an unknown nonlinear uh, dependency, a function that uh, or a variable that depends in a nonlinear manner on this uh, input variable, then you can use the projection tool of uh, polynomial chaos uh, using uh, functions or polynomials that are orthogonal between them, but also to the probability distribution of this variable. In this case, it's a Gaussian distribution, so I would use, I would use an approximation of Hermite polynomials like the ones you see here, and I would try to combine these in a multivariate way using different orders of them. And it turns out that just the fifth order approximation would actually give you something that's quite close to the original unknown relationship. So I can use this without really knowing what the underlying relationship is to uh, try and uh, approximate response. And that's what we did here in uh, field cases, in a number of field cases. In a bridge, you see here the case of a bridge in Zurich, where uh, we have here the plots of the evolution of the, natural, of the first four natural frequencies of the bridge with respect to uh, temperature. And uh, this would be with the blue points. And you see here the, uh, in green the prediction of our tool, uh, which uh, follows very well the evolution despite the effects of temperature. What you see in red is basically the training period we need. So we need the training period to be able to train the network and to be able to figure out what is the functional representation. But once this is established, then you can use it. Uh, for predicting. The same thing here in uh, data that were given to us by Alvaro Cunha on uh, uh, the Infante de Enrique Bridge in Portugal and also here for the more challenging case of a wind turbine facility where here things are a bit more complicated because you need to take into account the non-stationarity of the problem but that's just to show that you can actually do this. You just vary a bit the tool but the same thing can happen. Uh, once you have that, you can actually detect damage. And what you see here is basically the verification of the method on uh, a bridge that was destroyed or damaged in uh, Switzerland, in near Zurich. These are data that were given to us from uh, Leuven, our colleagues in Leuven, uh, who uh, were participating in the particular program that was monitoring the bridge for a period of some months. And then uh, there was a set of damages that were caused uh, uh, on the bridge. What the method does is that it provides an index which we can prescribe with, within given thresholds or ranges, and it's usually the case that infrastructure operators prefer the form of ranges rather than probability distribution functions uh, to be able to tell when damage occurs into the system uh, or not. 
the overarching question we're trying to uh, reply to is basically what are these indices that you can actually plot here on, uh, uh, that you can actually take into account and uh, uh, monitor their evolution through time? And what do you do next with them in order to be able to devise the appropriate, let's say, maintenance strategies or intervention schemes to prolong the life of your structure and to maximize uh, the investment uh, that we have done? Uh, with this, I give the floor to Dan. Now we actually I have this colleague in my university, and uh, after one hour of class, he always does yoga with his uh, students. So maybe I'm almost feeling like we should do the same, but unfortunately, I'm not a yoga master, so I will um, just continue. But so now we kind of bombarded you with techniques and tools that are available to come from data to information, and. There are quite likely others as well. But I think the idea was to give you just a, kind of a spectrum of, of, of tools that are available. And actually, that are tools that we have to consider, because all of these are valuable tools that, that are useful in some context, that we have to consider as part of this, this cost action. And now when we come to the second part, which is the actual quantification of the value of this kind of information, you see the difficulty that, on the one hand, we should consider all these possible cases, uh, make these analyses as precise as possible. But on the other hand, uh, if already the, the, you know, it takes a whole PhD to understand how to take the, to do the posterior part, which is to take the data and to get it into information, how can we make, or how, I mean, how can we get to the second part, which is now the, as you showed nicely, uh, Piotr, you know, is the, the outer bubble. You know? which probably requires now a, what in Germany we have this habilitation, okay? So you do a PhD in getting your structural health monitoring system to understand, to, to understand that, and then you do your habilitation another four years to do the quantification of its benefit. But uh, it's not the time we have. But, so this is this, the, the kind of conflict that we are in. Okay, this I've already seen many times, as it stated originally from economics and taken up by Howard in the engineering community. And I think the point to mention, to say here is, that, okay, we have to solve this. And this is, of course, a very simply, simple problem. In reality, things are much more high dimensional and so on. But we have to, this is the posterior problem, okay? So we try to, this is my uncertainty, given that I have some measurement and data, and then I try to find the optimal action under that, under those information, under my updated distribution. And we have seen tools to calculate this updated distribution. But now, we want to figure out, yes, okay, but if I don't yet have this data, but I want to obtain this data in the future, and I want to figure out how much is this data actually use, or how much use is it to me, well, then I'm here, and I have to consider all the possible outcomes of my, this is the set here, all the possible outcomes that I might potentially measure with my system in the future, and I have to integrate over all these possible outcomes. And so we have, and then I have, and if I want to maximize that even, if I want to figure out what is my optimal sensor configuration, what is my optimal inspection interval, I have to even maximize over that. So there's maximization, integration, and it's very difficult. Um, so, okay. You can also present that in a graphical form, in so-called influence diagrams, which the, co the computation ends up being the same, but sometimes it is more easily visible what is going on. In particular, if we have a sequence of decisions that have to be made over a lifetime, typically to show it in an influence diagram is kind of useful. Um, so it's, but it's, and it's, it's an extension of the Bayesian network where we basically indicate the causal relation between things, okay? So you know, most, many people think that the monitoring outcome determines my system state, but in reality, the causal relation is the opposite, okay? My actual system state determines what I will measure. The inference process is the other way around. I observe that and I infer about that, but the causal relations are in this, and this inference diagram should follow this causal relation, okay? My monitoring outcome will then determine what I do and so on. 
Okay, but I said, it's not going to, it's going to help us in the representation and the understanding of the problem, but the computations still remain equally difficult, same integration. Okay, so uh, there are many challenges associated with that. So we have seen in the morning that we can uh, obviously solve this problem for nice, um, relatively um, simplified, let's say, um, problems. And I believe we can, or I know that we can, and we have seen also some, or mentioned some examples where we can solve it for also real problems. But there are many challenges that when we come to real problems. One of them is, and this I just, actually this is again from this poster outside, um, is that what I call that we have to identify the decision context. So often people have some system, they know there is uncertainty, so what do we do? And don't look too much at this figure in, in detail, but they know what, um, they know that there's uncertainty. So that what they do is, okay, let's get some more certainty, let's put a monitoring system. And that is often very useful. But at that point, often it's not clear yet, at least not explicitly, what we are going to do with this information. However, if we want to make a pre-posterior analysis, if we want to calculate what is the value of that information, we need to understand what we are going to do with that information. That means before we have the information, we have to already model what we are going to do with that information. So that is often difficult in practice uh, to do for real systems, I have observed. Second thing is then, okay, in reality, there are so many possible things we can do, okay? This is a simple, this is a simple decision tree, which is just for one component of a structural system. And we have already many, many possible options how this can go, okay? We might uh, do some inspection, we might find something, we might do a repair, a repair, we might do a maintenance action, we might, you know, then different points in time. And so this, already this decision tree, not a real thing, gets very big. Uh, it exp exponentially it increases, as you can guess here, as you go on life over life cycle. This is just for one component with a relatively simple idea that it's the component is either damaged or not. In reality, the system can have many states, and that brings me to the next challenge. These systems are large, and just, this is just, just a, a simple structural system. Okay, steel, offshore, you know, what is the kind of simple structure? But this has many elements, and we could inspect this one, and we could inspect that one, and that one, and then we could repair this one. I mean, there is an infinite number of possible combinations of system states, of decisions, so all these trees that look nicely in the theory, but then they explode as we go. And, um, and so this is, a, this is a difficult problem. Next, which I also illustrate with these offshores. You can guess that that's some of the work I did. But, um, so, but that also was also quite nicely seen in the previous presentation, is that uh, we have, um, if, we do, if we do realistic models, these models can be computationally demanding. They are not like the climate models that some of the other, other um, areas use, but they are still demanding. And uh, we have to model, okay, this is just uh, showing again the fatigue problem in the offshore structure, but the, the point being that it might not, it might not be possible to do Monte Carlo simulation with possibly 10 to the power of nine simulations if we have these kind of more realistic models of structures. We have to reduce the number of times that we can actually run our model. Okay, so these are some of the challenges, and there are actually more challenges, um, which however are not necessarily, maybe these are the challenges that are more related to methods and tools. There's also a, a modeling challenge, I shouldn't, which is that um, here we always assume that we have a model, we know what we're going to look for, but often you install a monitoring system precisely because you don't have a model. And then how we do we deal with that, maybe something we should also consider. Okay, but coming back, what, what are some of the solutions? Okay, one of the things is that I found a very, actually very good solution in many cases, is we can actually quite well simplify. Or even though the decision problem actually is complicated and it seems to be complicated, and we have so many possible, you know, we see all these fancy plots and all this, we get lost. And we, sometimes the, the, you can actually reduce it to quite simple problems. And there might be approximations of the real world, but they are sufficiently precise to give us an idea about whether system A or B is, monitoring system A or B is better. So in this case, I mean, this was the same this decision tree. We can reduce it, for example, by not consider, only considering those branches in this tree that actually have some probability that is more than 
0 0.001 or something. And we can reduce the, so we can make a simple example. And actually, I'm not going to speak here, but I will point again to, to, to two posters that are out there. One is um, by Dr. Cotone, who is, and I'll just briefly explain that, uh, looking at the aircraft, um, health, health monitoring system in an aircraft. And this was a project that people developing these monitoring systems, they, you know, they very good people, really. I mean, they, they do very sort of sophisticated models of the system, of the, the, the aircraft wing, and, and so on. But then they were realizing that they don't know how to quantify the effect of the system on the reliability. And when they, when they come to ask us, okay, can you quantify us the reliability? The first answer is no. Because the reliability does not depend on the monitoring system alone. It depends on what you are going to do with the information that you use. And in order to, to then actually figure out what we're going to do, we had to sit down with the people and think, okay, what are you actually going to do with that information? And we assumed that, okay, they, it just gives you a green or red light. Green means you can fly, red means you cannot fly. And on that basis, which is actually not far from probably the, the truth, it's of course, uh, this, this high dimensional outcome of the monitoring system is reduced to a binary number. Namely, the interpretation is such that I can fly, I think I can fly, and is such that I think I cannot fly. In reality, you have infinite possible outcomes, but if you reduce it to this binary outcome, which is the interpretation, then we get a division tree that is actually manageable, and Dr. Cotone can tell you about this. And we calculate value of information here. And another example, just I find is a very nice example already mentioned this morning um, by Dr. Schwecken. Um, and I think I'll let him explain about, uh, where is he? Uh, I'll let him explain about his model. But again, you know, you can show that actually it's possible to get a engineering, of course it's not precise to the last digit, but an engineering outcome as to is it worthwhile to install a monitoring system or not in a real case. So, this, so, so simplify the actual problem, and I think this is the key. It's not really a tool that we figure of, or even, but maybe it's not even a method, it's more a modeling strategy. Don't get lost in these fancy things that you hear from people that do SHM. Try to extract and go back to the basics, and often you can find simple things. Okay. Okay, this I just want to mention briefly because it's not, uh, I think it's, uh, but it was also already mentioned in the morning as well. So, um, possibility might be to actually look into the calculations of these integrals, and that's what I tried here, just the first trial, but to look into the calculations of these integrals and see if we can make this more efficient to at least limit the number of times we have to calculate our model. And the, instead of using Monte Carlo, we could use important sampling, that's what I did here. Uh, where you focus on the region of actual interest. Because most of the monitoring outcomes, if you have a system and you want to use it for uh, che checking if you have damage, 99% of times you, no damage will occur and everything is fine. Mm -hmm. You might only focus on those cases that actually in lead to damage. Mm -hmm. and you can do that in a formal way using important sampling techniques or others, other, other techniques from structural reliability. Okay, and then you can, okay, we've already seen something like this, but this could be an outcome so that you have, uh, and with a few, few thousand samples, you can get this. Uh, what is the value of information as a function of number of measurements and measurement errors, and things like that. However, this is a hypothetical example. Now, uh, strategy number three, and since this will be, we're almost there. Our trick for not falling asleep. <laughs> we switch. Um, so I'm picking up with uh, an issue we think is of relevance in the uh, devising a framework that is robust uh, with respect to uncertainties for structural health monitoring, and uh, this is basically the issue of optimal sensor placement. And in the past, there have been a variety of methods that have been used, and they were mostly deterministic for sensor placement, uh, essentially trying to optimize the detectability of a mode. Uh, based on um, uh, the distribution of instruments. But uh, the issue is, in fact, a bit more complicated than what can be handled by a deterministic problem. 
through uh, uh, the fact that uh, in the uh, recent years we have a number of uh, monitoring technologies available which can be combined in a different way to optimize, let's say, cost with respect to the information that is returned from these systems, this now becomes a problem of increasing complexity. So you could have actually systems that have the same type of sensors that are, um, that are uh, implemented on the structure. You could have heterogeneous, as we call them, sensors, so fusing different types of information like acceleration and displacement that are collocated. Or you could have an even more complex problem where the, the sensors are actually non-collocated. And the issue is how do you uh, come up with the optimal placement of these instruments in order to optimize the amount of information that comes from these. And so now we have to uh, turn to approaches that are able to handle this kind of uh, uh, question in a statistical manner. Uh, some early approaches were based on uh, uh, the Fisher information matrix, but now the Bayesian approach, uh, and I guess again, Costas uh, or Gert, who have uh, previous work on this, could uh, elaborate on the topic. But this is uh, something that is worth uh, now looking into, especially since operators uh, need to be convinced through uh, solutions that are compromising in the, in the best uh, possible manner. Now, um, to conclude, essentially, I would like to also go over an approach that we have developed, having in mind the fact that operators need a clear or, let's say, a process that can sort of uh, more or less be standardized for, for decision making uh, regarding the maintenance of civil uh, structures. And now, for this, I go back to something that Michael pointed out, the fact that you have to rely also or you have to be alert and also look for solutions in other fields. And this is basically a method uh, borrowed from the field of robotics originally. So this is how you can plan the, um, uh, ra the route of an agent of a robot in robotics. You can use what is called the partially observable mar Markov decision process framework, uh, which uh, in contrast to the fully observable Markov decision processes where the world is supposed to be known and the states and actions of an agent are completely defined, we now introduce the uncertainty into the system. Uh, through this uh, essentially B symbol here, which is the belief that we have in the state of our system. Uh, and so the belief is something that is updated through Bayes, uh, the bias rule uh, once again. But uh, without tiring you with the details, I, I'm just going to say that this belief is related to the uh, reward that we can uh, get from uh, the system. And this reward is calculated based on the cost of the inspection or observation methods and also on the cost of re the repair actions that are foreseen for uh, such a system. So I will use an example from a specific structure, let's say a bridge system where you have a finite set of observations that are available and a finite set of actions that you can perform and for which you would like to devise a maintenance uh, framework. Uh, what this approach does is that it assumes uh, that the state of your system, which is a belief you have to calculate as part, let's say, or update as part of this uh, uh, algorithm, is given. And uh, you have a number of decision steps, or as they are called, horizons, in order to uh, take a decision uh, and organize your, let's say, maintenance framework. For this particular case, we have the simple uh, assumption of two types of observation. One that is more coarse, visual inspection. So it has, uh, let's say, uh, not so refined level of accuracy. It's basically a yes or no, good or bad situation with something intermediate. And you have a more refined monitoring system, which probably cost, uh, naturally would cost uh, more, but can give you a more refined level of information uh, through the, uh, depending on the state of your system X here. So this, uh, this is uh, essentially the uh, index that quantifies the system response. And this now you can relate to what I presented earlier, for instance, with a PC, a polynomial chaos tool that gives you an index, which is a condition uh, indicator. Uh, you also have a set of actions that are, of course, not exactly deterministic because we usually have simulation models that can only give us uh, some sort of probabilistic interpretation of what the effect of an action would be on our structure. Uh, and so how do you take these into account into a framework that can be easily uh, deployed? So the, the way you would do this is you uh, start with, let's say, um, a belief of your system at a given uh, time instance t for which uh, the method will give you a plot such as the one that you see, see here, where the colors are uh, relating to specific interventions and where the different symbols, maybe it's not so clear, are relating to different observations, or sorry, different uh, monitoring methods used. 
And so if uh, my belief tells me that I am uh, somewhere here, so the mean and variance of the belief would give me a situation that says that my system is somewhere about here, it would mean that I would have to choose a, an action, uh, which here you cannot see, but it's basically a welding. It's one of the intermediate actions uh, for improving our system. And also that the, my next observation should be the more refined, let's say, method uh, instead of visual inspection. When you perform this, you would find through the observation method that your belief is shifted because, of course, it gives you a new confidence into uh, where your system lies in the next time step. And then again, the process would be repeated. In this way, you can go about devising, let's say, a maintenance strategy. Of course, there are many things here to uh, take into account. The fact that this uh, becomes more computationally intensive when you put more, more dimensions into play. Um, and also that because it is a Markov-based approach, it doesn't have a memory, which is something that already has been improved by the work of Papa Costadino and Sinozuka. So the, but it has a lot of potential for uh, implementation, given the clear structure that it could be related to. Uh, and with this, I guess I return to Actually, Jan. Done. So, but, uh, just um, we're almost done, but this kind of framework can also be not exactly extended again, but the related framework is this so-called limited memory influence diagram. And actually, uh, as you know, Cheney Nielsen from Altwork is not, she's not here, but she's part of this. She's been working a lot on this. Which is essentially, because the problem of the, 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 the thing is that these trees, remember, they, they grow exponentially. And one way to cut that is to use this pump. But then I have to increase, introduce this belief state. The other option is that I consider that the, the agent, the decision maker, forgets, which is actually how we deal in reality with a lot of too much information. We just forget. And then we can focus again. And this is how this is helps. And then, so there, there is this idea of using these influence diagrams where the decision maker can forget. And that reduces the problem of this tree so it doesn't grow exponentially anymore. And as I said, actually, this taken from this paper by Janie and John Sorensen. And um, just to show that you can actually do something with that, so we have used something an influence diagram like that, this is the last slide, for uh, optimizing a warning system for natural hazards. So this is a slightly different problem. But there are a number of sensors, and we want to optimize the interpretation of the sensors and the placement and we can do that with this influence. We do, we do that with such an influence diagram, which you can actually download from the website. And we come up with this, now we come back to the beginning, you know, we come up with this probability of detection against false alarm. Okay? And these are the possible optimal solutions. And then we can find, using the value of information, which of these is the optimal configuration. Um, now, so, with this, actually, we did not bad. So we have left the time we wanted to leave for the discussion. Of course, this caused us to be a bit fast. And, uh, but um, this will give us, this leaves us now some time for discussion. And uh, well, the first thing I saw, what I said already at the beginning, yeah. we want to use this forum to, for, uh, for you to tell us or to, and also this is not, you can also answer it afterwards to us. You can write it by email or whatever. But we have the question, OK, did we leave out something that you think should be included? And don't tell, I mean, and, and, but that, I don't mean your paper. Uh, but I mean you know, a bit more general uh, methods or, or approaches that are part of this here. Or is it is a completely other dimension that we forgot? Um, and also the focus of this. Because it's not that clear uh, what is the focus of the working group yet. It's also not entirely clear how to, dis to separate this working group from the other working groups. I mean, some of the things we mentioned are more related to the theoretical aspects. Some of them are more related to the applications, to the health monitoring. The, the, it's not clear where to cut. And um, for sure, it's, not, it's related. The, the theoretical framework will directly determine what problems we have to solve. And that, in, that means the tools and methods that we need will depend a lot on what is the choice of the framework. Yeah. OK, but I shouldn't speak, actually. 
where you should speak. So, um, any comments at this point are very welcome.